You can see the screen, right? Mm -hmm. okay, yes. Terrific. Everything looks good. This meeting is also going to be recorded as a heads up and then posted on the teaching, the teaching platform that we normally use. So if you do not want your face to be on video or anything, just make sure that you are not on video. Um, just a heads up for everybody. Alrighty, y'all. So I do want to be respectful of our fantastic panelist time. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Carla. I have the privilege of being your moderator this afternoon. And we are first going to start with Ms. Sandy Rollins, who is the Executive Director of the Texas Tenants Union. She has more than 35 years of experience working with individuals, groups, and policymakers to protect and advance tenants rights in Texas and preserve and improve federally subsidized housing. And we have the fantastic fortune of having her in our presence tonight, uh, today. So she's going to start with a brief presentation about housing and security, after which we will move on into our panel discussion. So Sandy, go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you so much. Um, the Texas Tenants Union is a nonprofit tenants rights organization based in Dallas. And uh, we've been working on tenants' rights education, tenant organizing, and public policy advocacy since the 1970s. Um, so I'm gonna, I guess, just move straight into some of the stuff that, that we see uh, that's going on now as well as in years past. And for some reason, I am not able to advance my slide. That's weird. Um, yeah, uh, can you all advance uh, the slides on your end by any chance? Um, it's, yeah. Um, Give us one second, we're going to try to play around with the setting. Yeah. If that works. Yeah, I'm not sure why my slides are not advancing, but um, yeah, I can go back out and try a different, perhaps, um, let me see if I can do a different view here. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll just just keep it like that. That's will this work? Yeah, <laughs> um, perfect. Okay. Uh, so um, there's a group called BC Workshop in Dallas that uh, puts out a, a state of housing report. And um, a few years ago, they found that there were 68,000 households in Dallas who couldn't afford to pay more than uh, $400 a month in housing costs. That definitely rings true to us, at least that. Um, eviction filings in Dallas County um, in 2019, there were more than 40,000. They're actually about half of that in 2020 because of the various eviction protections that were put in place due to COVID-19. Um, but uh, it's, it, it, it was a crisis pre-COVID. It's certainly not gotten any better since COVID, um, it, with the exception of we do have this patchwork of protections in place that has so far held off a lot. Um, you know, when, when they can resume, um, it's going to be a scary situation. Uh, you know, there's a racist um, implications here. Women of color face the highest eviction rates, according to the MacArthur Foundation, and uh many others you know you can you know don't get paid as much um uh a variety of reasons there um you know strong um history of racism in the country that that uh you know kept people out of home ownership as well and um so more likely to be renting both because their incomes are lower and because of the historic um, inability to have the same opportunities to purchase housing as um you know, white Americans did. Uh, the census consistently shows uh, 
almost half of Dallas tenants paying 30% or more of their income for rent. That's considered the affordability standard. I, I think actually, um, you know, if your income is uh, is too low, 30% is too much. You know, if, if you work it backwards on, um, say, uh, you know, a, a minimum wage worker or somebody on social security, you know, how much does it cost to eat? How much does it cost for transportation? How much does it cost for medicine? Um, how much does it cost for childcare? Um, you know, 30% of income would be way too high, but that is the accepted standard, um, just not by, you know, our organization and, and probably some others. Um, there's a group called the National Income Housing Coalition and they put out a, uh, something called the GAP Report every year. Uh, they actually just came out with one this week and, and um, you know, they found for, there are only 21 units available to every 100 extremely low income tenants in the Dallas-Fort Worth Arlington area. I think statewide it's 29 units. So, you know, there's a lot of people that end up paying more than they can afford in rent or end up being homeless. Um, Texas doesn't have any rent control, um, nor are there any regulations on, on uh, most fees. And so, you know, the trend in recent years is not only to jack up the rent at every opportunity when the lease expires, but to tack on uh, extra fees. And it, it's, you know, so tenants typically pay a mandatory uh, pest control fee, a, a trash pickup fee, mandatory valet trash pickup fee. Uh, there are some properties that on lease renewal, if you don't, uh, you, you're required to buy into their uh, cable TV package, an internet package, which is typically, you know, 80 bucks a month extra. And if you can't afford it, well, too bad. You, you, you find someplace else to, to go. Um, so they're, they're just uh, getting more and more creative, going way beyond nickels and dimes on tacking extra stuff on. So there are federal housing assistance programs, um, actually both for homeowners and for tenants. Um, most homeowners don't think of themselves as necessarily having subsidized housing, but if you are, you know, have a, an expensive enough home uh, in, in the United States, you get to deduct your mortgage interest from your taxes each year, and that's a housing subsidy. Although, again, most, if you ask a wealthy person if they live in subsidized housing, I'm sure they would say absolutely not. Uh, but they, we are subsidizing that through the tax code. Um, meanwhile, there are uh, programs like public housing and uh, project-based Section 8 housing and the Section 8 voucher program that uh, enable low-income people to pay 30% of their income towards rent with the government paying the rest. But that is, um, that's not an entitlement program. Just because you're eligible for it doesn't mean you get it. And, and um, it's typically one in four that uh, who are eligible for the program actually receives it. Whereas the mortgage interest deduction program I'm telling you about for homeowners, that is, that is an entitlement program. If you're eligible, you get it. You don't have to apply. You don't have to be on a waiting list. You just get it. So, um, and so what we've seen in, I think, uh, major cities around the country, certainly around Texas and definitely in Dallas, is the, the more affordable older housing stock is, is being demolished and replaced with high-end housing. And so we've seen entire neighborhoods, primarily with people of color, uh, being replaced. And Stephanie, who's on the panel, is going to talk about that. So here's just a couple, you know, this is uh, in West Dallas. Um, there's an owner called HMK that a couple years back decided that rather than comply with city code, he was going to shut down all his properties. Uh, he ended up giving everybody 30 days notice to get out. Um, this is a, a community very close to downtown, and I'm sure he gets was getting offers every day through organizing. There was a different outcome somewhat, and Stephanie will talk about that. Um, Crosstown in East Dallas, this is what you see. So this, this house the, is, you know, from the 1920s. Um, next door, you can see, you know, uh, very expensive, uh, very modern development going in. And here we're back in West Dallas. So you can see a row of uh, townhomes that have gone in in recent years. Um, and I don't even know if this blue house is still there. I took that picture, you know, a year or so ago. Um, and then this is the kind of notices that tenants get. So um, this was a property in East Dallas, uh, very close to downtown. 
Um, tenants were given a 60 day notice that they had to leave. Most of the tenants there had already gone on month to month lease contracts. New owners came in, planned to redevelop. You know, there's no relocation assistance that was required. Um, uh, this property was occupied um, very low income, um, mostly black and, and some Cambodian tenants, uh, some that had Section 8 vouchers. No relocation assistance was being offered. None is required. It was just, uh, you know, that we're closing down. And, and by organizing, we were able to get an extension and some relocation help. But again, uh, nothing in state law, nothing in local law requires that. It's just get out. And then this one, it was um, the Dallas Independent School District uh, uh, bought a property. It was like more than 300 units. Um, that they intended to demolish for a school and when the tenants organized to uh you know ask for more time this was full of school age children and they were asking people they were trying to move people out during the school year and they stopped maintaining the property and you know their initial notice that when they when they took over was you still have leases you're still expected to pay rent so when we helped the tenants organize and they went to a school board meeting to ask for, you know, leave it open until at least the end of the school year, they get this notice saying, you know, it's dated February 22nd, says uh, your leases are terminated on March 20th, not even a 30 day notice, and then evictions will be filed. Again, um, legal aid uh, 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 got involved as well and helped negotiate a better deal than that. But it was, you know, this is, um, it's a recipe for homelessness when you're telling people that, you know, are paying more than they can afford in rent, um, you know, struggling to get to the end of each and every month. Um, you know, they can shut down at will and uh, it, it almost always makes people homeless. So this is just one fuzzy letter. Sorry about this, but Trammell Crow is a huge developer nationwide based here. Uh, they've done this over and over again for decades. And this happened to be a notice that the tenants got. Um, dated September 30th to be out by October 31st. And um, uh, when I got out there, people, you know, had already uh, moved stuff out. Um, many did become homeless, at least for the interim, um, because it's just not enough time. So the Texas Apartment Association is the landlord's trade group, um, and, and it's the most widely used lease contract we see for tenants in private housing. So um, it's a, the basic contract is eight pages, very fine print, on legal size paper, and then they're, they're, you know, in total, there might be, um, you know, a dozen extra uh, lease addenda and, uh, you know, maybe you got 45 or 50 pages of the entire lease contract. Um, you know, the option of not signing this is really not real because if you don't like this contract, you know, you can, move, you know, try the people across the street, but this is probably going to be the contract that you're, you're presented with. So you can see that uh, they have a right to terminate. You can sign a lease for a year. Um, think you've got a contract for a year. But um, in the event of a catastrophic damage, they can terminate by giving seven days notice. They also have the right to terminate by giving a 30 day notice if they're demolishing the apartment or closing it and will no longer be used for residential purchase purposes for at least six months. So we see that in gentrifying neighborhoods. Um, and we've also seen the seven day provision come into play since all the pipes burst due to the uh, severe weather we had and the failure of our electrical uh, providers to winterize. <laughs> um, as they gambled with people's lives. So uh, a couple years ago, the city of Dallas decided to come up with a so-called comprehensive housing policy. There should be quotes around that. Um, we think it was not comprehensive and not a decent policy. Um, what they, they found, they paid somebody like, you know, a bunch of money to do a market value analysis. And they said there's a shortage of 20,000 units that are needed and that they wanted to incentivize development for the next three years to do these 20,000 units. Now keep in mind on my first slide, 68,000 people can't afford to pay more than $400 a month for their housing cost. Uh, you know, 40,000 evictions in the county, um, uh, you know, typically. Um, but they decided they're gonna incentivize development, you know, um, at 
for people at 120 and 100 uh, of the air, um, area median income or 100% of the area median income, um, you know, and at home ownership at much greater levels than they do people down here at the bottom. So people at 30% and below, you know, these are folks on social security, probably students, uh, as well as, um, you know, minimum wage workers. Um, this is where a huge need is, yet you can see the priority kind of went up here at the top. So, um, you know, so here's, here's how the math plays out. Um, so the rents or the, the mortgage payment at 100 or 120% of the area median income is, um, it can be, you know, $1,746 for an efficiency apartment, um, you know, and up to $2,694 for a four bedroom. Um, you know, these places are on the private market. Even, even at 80% of the area median income, these places, this is what's out there right? I mean, this is pretty much market rate housing. It's only when you get, you know, at the, the 30 and 50%, I mean, you're not seeing any development. Um, uh, you know, nobody rents a one bedroom for 500 bucks anymore. So this is kind of where we need city subsidies to go or state subsidies or federal subsidies because, you know, the market doesn't produce units at this level. They do produce units at this level. And so, um, there's something called tax increment financing districts or TIF programs, and they say, you know, we're producing affordable housing, um, and we're going to require it to be available to people at 80% of the area median income. But again, you can you can satisfy that with an efficiency unit that costs more than $1,100 a month. And um, meanwhile, the people that um, you know, really need an affordable place to live, that might be, you know, their total monthly income. So uh, wrapping up this one, we need more affordable housing for extremely low income people. The, the existing voucher program and other federal programs are insufficient to meet the need. We're seeing people priced out of the housing market. Um, so the average social security check in 2020 was 1,500 a month or well, uh, $1,503 a month. And so by using the 30% of income standard, they should be paying no more than $451 in rent and utilities. Again, that unit does not exist on the private market. And a minimum wage worker, the math comes out to 377. Um, so this is where um, we wanna see uh, any public money going. Uh, and then Texas tenant landlord law is also really bad. Um, we've made progress through the years. Um, you know, every legislative session, they meet from January to May uh, in odd numbered years. So the session's going on right now. This is our little limited window of opportunity to try to advance tenants' rights. Uh, but uh, in terms of eviction law, we don't have any just cause eviction protection, so they don't have to have a reason to ask somebody to move out once the lease is expired. There's no counterclaims in an eviction case. There's no right to withhold rent, no matter how bad the conditions are. Uh, a very short notice can be given um, before a landlord files with the court, um, 24 hours notice to vacate uh, uh, with the Texas Apartment Association lease, and then the landlord can file. There's no opportunity to cure the default, meaning you know you have 24 hours to pay or move. It's, you have 24 hours to vacate. Um, then, uh, as I mentioned, rents and fees aren't regulated, um, uh, and uh, you know a number of other things, including um, landlords don't have to give notice before they enter. Um, I do have a list of. Uh, our policy recommendations and then some other reading on um, uh, just recommendations for decent housing policy. So I think I'm at my limit and I'm gonna pass it back to you. Well, thank you so much for that, Sandy. That was highly informative and it breaks my heart to hear a lot of those things, but I'm also inspired to know that there are people like you and your colleagues on the ground actively organizing against housing insecurity. We're going, go, going ahead and um, transitioning into our panel that features Lizzie Schmitz, Yar Singh, and Stephanie Hansen. This panel is going to last about 30 minutes, and I'm just going to ask them a few questions about their experiences with housing and security, and we're going to learn from them and their answers. Um, I really appreciate the three of you for being here and for being so brave to share your stories. 
let's go ahead and start by having each of you just briefly introduce yourselves, um, whichever order you like. I'm sure we'll get the flow of it. It's a pleasure to meet you all today. It's great to be here and see so many people being engaged with this workshop. Uh, my name is Lizzie Schmitz. I am a sophomore at the University of Texas at Dallas. I'm a molecular biology major and a neuroscience minor. A little bit about myself. I am on the pre-research track. Um, scientific research and clinical research is my thing. Um, and I am interested in the field of immunology and I love engaging with campus activism. Thank you, Lizzie. Awesome. Um, hey guys, uh, my name is Yash Singh. I am an alumnus from UT Arlington, so not UT Dallas, but uh, the other one. I served as uh, the student body president of uh, UT Arlington for the year 2018 and 19, which is where I also met Carla when she was the student body vice president of UTD. Uh, currently, I'm based out of India, uh, which is my home country. I also am an international student in, uh, in the U.S. when I was there. And yeah, glad to be here. Glad to be a part of this panel. Thank you, Ash. My name is Stephanie Hansen, and thank you for having me today. Um, what brought me here to meet Sandy Rollins was the HMK, uh, HMK housing crisis or the landlord tenant crisis of Dallas in general. Um, I am a mother of two. My daughter is a graduate of UT. <laughs> and uh, um, I was a soldier, a nurse, and uh, and uh, did a few other things in life. But um, the crisis uh, is what brought me to Sandy. And to just say this before we really get started is, you know, organize and try to meet people like her in you know in your city to uh, help with the problems. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm really glad that all three of you are here. My next question is, uh, could you each tell me a little bit about your experience with housing and security in whichever capacity you're comfortable sharing? We'll so, all right, so a little bit about more about my situation. I was a peer advisor on the UT Dallas campus. And for all of y'all that are not, from UT Dallas, um, PA is basically the same thing as an RA. It's analogous to that. We just use a different name here. Um, and I was working for a semester and I was terminated at the end of my first semester working. Um, and it wasn't an isolated incident. There were, um, don't quote me on the numbers, but there were about 10 to 13 other individuals that were um, in my team that were also terminated from their position. Um, and the PA position is a really tricky one because housing is directly tied with your career. Um, they, it's excellent for students that are financially disadvantaged um, and need free housing along with a stable income, but it's also really precarious in that whenever or if ever you get terminated, you lose your housing and it's so easy to, to get into a situation where you're facing housing insecurity, homelessness, financial problems. It's, it's very, very tricky. Um, and that happened to me in the month of December of 2020. Um, it was a really tricky situation for me. Um, me or I and several of my other coworkers were terminated um, and effectively phasing housing insecurity, houselessness, um, no stable income. And of course, during December, you think, oh, wow, finals, Christmas. You think of all these holidays that are happening, saving up money for gifts for your friends and family. And this was just a really difficult time to be facing this situation um, financially and logistically uh, with no stable income to support yourself throughout this difficult time and having to focus on moving out um, it just was a really tense situation. Okay. Uh, um, well, what, what uh, brought me to the HMK property was um, I had started to uh, 
purchased a home in 2003 in West Dallas. I was a nurse, as I stated. Uh, my mother and my son uh, lived with me. Uh, my mother became, was diagnosed with uh, stomach cancer. And I knew I wanted to spend more time with her. So what I did, I did decide to downsize and let the house go while looking for something that I could afford uh, for the amount of days that I could afford to work. So I did that, uh, talked to people in the different neighborhoods. My mom wanted to stay near her church, which was in West Dallas. So, you know, me trying to accommodate that issue and find something that I could afford uh, and not to be, be too far so she could attend her church services. Um, and, I, and this did turn out to be term, a terminal illness. Um, so I moved into the property in September of 2010. Um, we stayed there after her passing. And again, too, it was close to the hospitals. It was close to Parkland. So that's where she was being treated at. So, you know, from, from May of 2010 until she passed in July of 2010, we probably spent two to three days a week at Parkland. So it would have been difficult to travel from other parts of the city for her to receive treatment. And also um, still, take care of my son who is autistic and uh, in his 30s at the uh, early 30s at the time. So that's how I came to live in the property. I did have to do some cleaning of my own when I moved in there, like major cleaning, uh, notified them, you know, of the issue. Um, didn't receive um, you know, any any deduction on the deposit or anything. So uh, I did move in. I did make the house into a home. And uh, that's how I ended up with in a crisis. Awesome. Um, well, to uh to give some context regarding my situation, I haven't personally felt any issues of housing insecurity, thankfully, because hearing your stories really, you know, sends a very powerful message about what you guys are coming across. But being a part of UT Arlington, which is a very international student heavy campus, um, I got to see some really disturbing cases of how uh, the housing office and just in general, the, the division of student affairs kind of um, behaves in uncertain matters. Uh, to give you an example, um, I mean, apart from my term as student body president, I also was a member of student government and was active within the international community. And we really, there were situations that came about in terms of um, individuals I knew of, individuals I indirectly knew of, where uh, just the slightest mistake, just the most simple mistake will cost them uh, nearly, you know, everything. Uh, to, uh, you know, for an international student who's coming to America to study, uh, housing should be the last thing on his mind, on her mind, you know, uh, when they're trying to study here, when they're trying to get good grades, maybe get a job, an internship, and then you see that there is this whole situation with housing comes about just either because of their own fault a mistake that they must have committed by you know by error or by someone else's fault that they had nothing to do with um you know something that lizzie mentioned about the pas and ras as we call them in utr the resident assistants uh, there is a very fundamental problem that comes that, that the housing office of the housing departments and universities have really um issued upon, and I'm not sure if this is because, if this is intentional or not, but 
the position of an RA, which is supposed to be such a fun and such an amazing position, they're the ones representing the university almost. Um, everyone outside the university looks into the university and looks at RAs as like the most uh, involved people on campus. And unfortunately, this position has ended up becoming, um, they've made it into this mini cop-like role where you know, you have to be able to give them numbers. You have to be able to like report back to your supervisors with uh, incident reports, with uh, all kinds of stuff. If you're not doing that, then you're not doing your job well. And, and when, you, when your job requires you to report stuff mandatorily, that is a fundamental issue that people are just not looking at within the division of student affairs. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things that uh, during my time in university, I was able to really uh, see up close. Yash, I actually have a brief follow-up for you specifically. Could you describe how you feel the issue of housing insecurity is uniquely exacerbated for international and undocumented students and what you've seen? Well, for first, uh, the first thing that I mentioned was that, you know, housing should be the last concern for someone who's on a visa or who's undocumented studying in a university. Uh, they have, like, Personally speaking, when I came to the U.S. back in 2015, I literally knew nobody. There was no family that I had. I had one friend uh, who I had just known through my high school in India, um, and that was it. And if at that time in my freshman year or my sophomore year, if I had known uh, due to some issues, if my roommate had just bought some liquor in the room by mistake and I was underage at the time, maybe I'm not responsible directly for it, but just by being in the presence of alcohol, that would, be, that would have made my whole situation a mess. I mean, I'm sure there's people in here who've been through student conduct and nobody likes going through student conduct. Uh, that's, uh, especially when you're not aware about the consequences and, you know, and how just massive that is for you. So, um, that's the, one of the first things that international students uh, in general, it just it becomes worse for them. And, and I think, I mean, and I'm not sure if, if I should even say it like this, but I think at times international students become really easy targets uh, for the housing office. Uh, just, they're just extremely convenient to target. Um, they're not gonna ask a lot of questions. They're typically rule followers. I'm just, I'm being very general, I know that, but like, if you're coming from India, Asia, China, you're not gonna ask questions to authorities, and that's just a cultural thing. Um, and when you're told that you're doing something wrong, you're probably gonna be like, well, what am I supposed to do to correct this? And when you're being punished for something that maybe you didn't feel you did wrong, that just makes your entire experience, your entire campus experience worse in a way that the words can't explain. And I've seen this happen with individuals I know, and it's the most unfortunate thing uh, that I've seen. I appreciate you sharing that, Yash. The next question that I have is more specifically directed towards Lizzie and Stephanie, but of course, Yash, feel free to tailor it in whatever way you see fit, given what you've seen your peers experience. Um, Lizzie and Stephanie, could you please describe after this incident that occurred that led to housing insecurity, what you two had to do to make do afterwards and to survive anything that you're comfortable with? First and foremost, I really want to echo the sentiments and the viewpoints that Yash was explaining to all y'all. It is so true. Being a peer advisor is such, you know, you're supposed to be the face of the campus and there's a lot of pressure put on you and it's an excellent leadership position. But at the same time, it's I can tell you from my experience, we bear the brunt of a lot of the expectations and the pressure given on to us by our superiors. You know, if we make one mistake, if we miss one deadline, um, then we are met with really heavy consequences. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of pressure upon the job and it can put you in a really precarious situation. Um, a little bit about my situation. So there, I'll tell you a little bit more contextually wise why a lot of people in our department were let go um, so there was an issue with policy um, there was something that a lot of different PAs on campus didn't understand and there was a rule that many PAs broke myself included um, it was in the fine print and of course we signed numerous contracts going into this career um, but this was something that really demonstrated that this wasn't an isolated incident 
where, you know, oh, if there was one PA that was acting up and doing something bad or malicious, then of course, like disciplinary consequences must happen. But when it's an issue where so many people have a misunderstanding about policy that leads to all of them being fired, it's leaving 13 different people houseless with no income, no money during the holidays, during final season, is, is just beyond me. It, it blows my mind. The emotional, the, I, the depths that I felt of just misery and frustration at that time was, it was so awful. My family was in a really precarious situation financially. My mother is unemployed um, and my father received a massive pay cut because of the pandemic. And we were freaking out because we didn't know where I was going to find a new place to live. I didn't know if I could afford a place off or on campus. Um, I didn't know if I would have to put all of my belongings in storage. I have a queen size bed. I have heavy furniture. I don't know how I would be able to move that. Um, I didn't know how I was going to fit that in storage, let alone pay for storage. Um, and it was a huge ring roll. They basically told us that we had until December 14th to evict, to be evicted um, and pack up everything. And it was so stressful. Like during finals, I was taking 17 hours last semester. And mind you, I was taking six different finals that I had to study for. And here I am packing up all of my belongings in the midst of final season with no money. I had to sell my designer coach handbags. I had to sell a lot of my fine jewelry. I had to sell a lot of my clothes that I was really sad to part with. But I, it's what I had to do. I, it was a may, way of me surviving and finding a way I could afford moving trucks, movers. And it was a really, really gut-wrenching time in my life. There really was no time for me to think about how I was doing emotionally. I was I had to I had to be brave and I had to be stoic going through it because just getting my stuff from point A to point B was my main priority. And on top of that, studying for six different finals was so stressful. Um, I can honestly tell you that my GPA would have been higher and my grades would have definitely been higher had I had the time to focus on my finals. Um, if I didn't have to move a lot of my belongings and having to worry about where I was going to live. Like I said, I didn't know where I, where I was going to live. I thought about living in my car. I thought about living at my parents' place, um, far away. Um, so it's not like my parents could, you know, just come by the next day and help me. They live all the way down in Houston and it would be a huge trip for them, huge undertaking for them to go help me. But we luckily managed to work it out. Um, UTD Housing, kudos to them. They did find me a new apartment um, that I'm currently residing in. I'm very thankful that I found a new place to live. Um, but logistically and financially and emotionally, it was such a nightmare for me and my family coming up with ways we could make ends meet and pay off my lease. Thank you, Lizzie. I'll go ahead and turn it to Stephanie to to share her story? Uh, well, the case that started uh, basically as a fight between the city and uh, the landlord and other landlords in the city of Dallas who had large amounts of property. Um, some had, the, I think our landlord uh, had the largest amount there was 300 properties, but in each house, no one's really exactly sure of the count of individuals that this impacted. Because say for instance, at 300 houses, if there was two people, 600 people, there was three people living in the house, 900 people, and so on and so on and so on and on. So, this case um, bounced back between the uh, just for the peace court uh, to the one of the district courts and it lasted for probably two years maybe a little longer um, some um, people during this time got really disgusted um, uh, as a neighborhood leader in which I was um, president of a neighborhood association in West Dallas, 
called Victory Gardens. And uh, I had people that I, concern, I was concerned about. And uh, so initially, even though I was being impacted, the battle was not about me. It was about, hey, what about all these other people who were maybe even less um, able to move out suddenly. Um, I find that for myself, I am the person who can fight for others, of course, much better than I can fight for myself. So um, basically, the first year, year and a half, it, it, I used myself, but it was because of, and you know, other people that I saw that I could almost say, okay, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm in a slightly better situation, um, but not that great, but uh, just a little bit. So we went to JP court multiple times where he, he would put notices on our door, uh, notices that weren't correctly placed. So then I say, hey, as a tenant, we don't have many rights, but know the rights that you do have. And, you know, and don't wait until the roof falls in, you know, start using those rights well before that. As Sandy mentioned, you can't <laughs> withhold your rent. And uh, you would even like to think, well, if I took the rent money, and had it repaired, I'd be in a better situation. No, you're not going to be in a better situation. You may temporarily be in a better situation, but you know you're still on. If there's no agreement in writing from the landlord that you can make those repairs, then you're still in a same or worse uh, shape because you still owe the rent. And then he can say, well, you didn't pay it or you didn't pay it on time. So we went through uh, multiple months and it's like I said, year and a half or so where the landlord, he refused to pay rent, uh, receive the rent. The rent was, uh, we had to get money orders every month. We had to go to his office. We had to sign the book saying we were here to pay rent. We had to make copies of the money orders. Then we had to attempt to save the money. Okay. A uh, person who has little to no means, as she, uh, as she stated earlier, you know, you have an extra $500 to live on. And so, you know, you want to save the money but the car breaks down. You want to save the money, but the electric bill was high. So, you know, a lot of people uh, weren't able to put their money aside and not touch it in order to say, hey, I did buy a money order on that day. I did come to your office and attempt to pay the rent. You did refuse the rent because with uh, several of us, as it was brought out in district court, did attempt to pay our rent and our landlord refused to accept it. So, you know, while you're going to court, while you're meeting with Texas Tenants Rights Union, while you're meeting with other groups um, that were advocating for you and for your neighbors, we were protesting, we were, um, you know, the landlord. Uh, we were having talks with the city. Uh, we were trying to work out something so that so many people would not be displaced out of their homes. And so after doing all of that, and basically after being used as pawns, by the landlord with the against and with the city of Dallas, then we some people were eventually allowed to purchase their homes. 
of the homes, and probably not one home was appraised for the actual price that he sold it for. Say the home might have been in the property at that time, it was like maybe 20,000. He sold it for 60 plus thousand with um, so much percent interest for 20 years. Um, the contracts that he had people sign, um, as uh, I think Yash Yashi might have mentioned, were, um, were not favorable for undocumented uh, individuals who lived in his properties. Um, he might have given them something in English, but they only spoke and read Spanish. They might not even <laughs> really sp uh, read Spanish, but they spoke Spanish. Um, there was no one to interpret uh, what the contract said. Uh, some of the older individuals, uh, say 75 to 90 plus years, who had maybe lived in those rental properties for several years, were given contracts that said, basically, you can live for another 20 years and you can pay on this house. But once you die, the house uh, comes back to the landlord. And those contracts, um, um, people might have attempted to fight those contracts, but in the long run, uh, I'm not sure that anyone prevailed in those um, in, in that situation, so there were many um, older people who had lived in the same houses for forty plus or fifty plus years, who were just um, traumatized by the thought of having to move to another neighborhood, some place that they did not know. Um, you know, out of a house in which they had lived in for that many years. And so some of them did buy houses for those prices and sign those contracts. And um, as we know, as, as, as probably what will happen, those contracts um, will, the houses property will be returned to the landlord upon the death of those individuals. Um, I was fortunate enough to um, be able to afford something a little bit more afterwards. Um, I will say that due to this being um, uh, a fight between the city of Dallas and this landlord, um, the city of Dallas allocated, um, I think it was like $300,000, um, which I think was um, managed by Catholic Charities. Uh, and I have nothing but thumbs up for Catholic Charities um, that uh, we were able to get money to help us relocate those that hung in there. I'm not sure how, I haven't been able to talk to anyone who moved out and prior to the, the city of Dallas uh, coming and voting to give that 300,000 um, for the youth. Mm, basically, we didn't get any cash uh, for our efforts. Uh, we were we did get uh, money to store our our stuff if need be. Um, there was help with uh, utilities. There was also uh, help with the uh, deposit fees. Uh, so some of us did receive some help. A lot didn't. And then some of those properties that the people purchased were, of course, not up to code. 
which is something that impacted our having to move also. So city ordinance also played a major, major impact. And I'm thinking it was chapter 27. I've been trying to look over a few things uh, this week uh, regarding single family dwelling. Uh, so know your rights. <laughs> know what uh, city code is supposed to do, uh, know how to effectively get them to do what they're supposed to do, which is a major problem and what hadn't been done over the last 50 years, per se, in West Dallas. Code was not enforced. Uh, the area was effectively redlined, and the city did nothing to uh, encourage those landlords to do what should have been done. Um, so, um, and when I did move out in July of, uh, well, three years ago, July the 7th, um, there were still people who were in those homes who were either looking for homes that they could afford or uh, was just trying to hang, you know, hang in there as long as they could. And before they became, would become homeless, uh, if they weren't uh, willing to purchase from the landlord, which I, I was not. I definitely was one of the ones that was not willing to ever give him another penny. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think that pretty much wraps that up for me, unless and there's something you would like to ask specifically. I appreciate all of that. That was informative and also disheartening at the same time, but I hope that we see changes to, to housing policies in, in the near future. Um, Yash, is there anything that you would like to add to this question of how you've seen people make do and survive other, um, otherwise? Um, well, most of my experiences are going to be very limited to what I've seen. Um, and so what I have seen at the end of the whole housing, I mean, when you do go through student conduct, when you do go through that whole uh, issue of, you know, either getting housing probation or, I mean, if you're on campus pretty much specifically and you're going through that, the only option you do have is you move off campus and, you know, you hope to God that there is something off campus for you uh, that is not too expensive to be able to be a part of. So. Um, I mean, more and more I've seen people uh, stray away from on-campus housing specifically for that reason, which is why also you'll see more and more people not living in dorms after their first year, uh, people not you know, moving into apartments on campus, uh, it's, it's at least in UT Arlington, I saw that. And so, um, uh, I mean, hey man, I, as I mentioned, international students are out here on a visa. They're very innocent about this whole thing they're not going to fight the system about this stuff. They're just going to make do with what they have and just move on. And so, you know, that's, that's what it is. Well, I appreciate the three of you so much. This was tremendously insightful. And again, I applaud and admire your bravery to share your stories and your lived experiences. We're going to go ahead and move on into the next portion of our teaching, which is going to be featuring Ms. Emily Edwards from DePaul University. She's going to talk a little bit about their housing security program there, and hopefully we'll come out of this with some insights and tips for what other universities can be doing as well throughout the nation. Hello, thank you so much. Um, so first off, yeah, I just wanna echo what Carla was saying. Thank you to um, the three of you for sharing. Um, yeah, stories of resilience and courage um, through situations that you should have never been put through. Um, so thank you for also taking the time to share. Um, so I know it's not easy to relive those things um, through storytelling. So just wanted to name that first. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Emily Edwards. Um, she, her pronouns. I 
am located in Chicago, Illinois, and I'm the Chicago Program Director for DePaul USA's um, Chicago DAX program. Um, I have a short PowerPoint that I'm going to go over that just kind of shows um, what the DAX program does here in Chicago. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free to, if anyone has any questions or anything, um, feel free to jump in and stop me. Um, all right, so here we go. Oh, and before I add that, um, before I start the presentation, I just also wanted to name that um, this is one possible solution. Um, I think that um, this, like housing insecurity is such a huge issue that intersects with so many other issues, like, you know, uh, like living wage, um, you know, pay equity, you know, racial justice issues, um, you know, queer and trans inclusion in our society. So, you know, this is one possible solution, but um, this is kind of an after the fact, like after people are already dealing with housing insecurity. So I do just always like to say that, you know, I see housing insecurity and homelessness, um, the main cause is a form of systemic violence of some sort that affects people on a personal level in their lives. So I think it's important to, you know, this is one possible solution and a model that we are working with um, that I think is a great response um, for college and universities um, on a program level. Um, and yeah, I would love to see more um, on also the advocacy and policy level. Um, so programs like this don't have to exist, right? Like I would love to not have a job um, in this area one day. Like I love my job, but um, I just think that's important to um, think of as we're going through um, this program. So here we go. All right. Um, so DePaul USA Chicago DAX program, um, I shared a little bit, I'm not gonna read everything that's on the slide, um, but DePaul USA is actually um, a separate 501c3 nonprofit organization. We are not um, um, an, an entity under DePaul University. We started in Chicago um, with our DAX program um, to support students experiencing housing insecurity and homelessness because our national organization of DePaul USA that's in those six cities, um, soon to also be in New York City, um, was moving our headquarters from Philadelphia to Chicago. And we, as we were moving, started asking around what kind of program is needed in Chicago um, as we move locations. And one of the things that kept coming up was housing for youth and young adults especially youth and young adults that are college students. Um, I think that, you know, some people are seeing more stories about this in the media, um, but for a lot of folks, I still get some very surprised looks um, and a lot of questions around this issue of homelessness with college students. Um, it's an issue that's been um, growing for years, um, but I think it's just starting to get some media attention um, now, which I think has been really helpful. Um, so back in 2015, when DePaul USA moved to Chicago, um, that is when we started the program, um, the DAX program. And we have recently expanded into Philadelphia, and then in a month or so, um, doing another DAX program for college students in New York City. Um, the other programs, however, in the other cities, um, there are day centers, there are overnight shelters, there's permanent supportive housing, um, and that is more, um, I would say, working with folks that are experiencing um, um, a chronic homelessness and have had multiple um, episodes of homelessness or housing insecurity in their lives, um, whereas with college students um, and young adults, it sometimes can look a little bit different. Um, so our goals as an organization of DePaul USA, that umbrella you see here, um, overcome the immediate crisis of homelessness, improve overall health, increase economic well-being and stability, and attain and sustain housing. Um, we see that health, mental health, finances, um, pretty much every area of someone's life um, improves once they have stable housing um, and access to food. Um, 
yeah, so we try to fall under that housing first model. Um, yeah, and seeing housing as a human right. So the DAX program, I just want to zoom out a little bit and look at um, the issue of college um, homelessness and housing insecurity. So um, back in 2016, HUD said as many as 58,000 college and university students are facing homelessness across the country. Um, I think that, you know, that's a big number. And I would say that that is probably low, um, like much lower than the reality. Um, which I think is important to recognize. Um, DePaul University estimates that at least 50 students are homeless or housing insecure in a given academic quarter. Um, and then there's a great, it used to be called Wisconsin Hope Lab, and now it's called um, the Hope Center. And um, so almost half of college students experience some form of housing insecurity in the past year. Um, and I think this is where that difference of housing insecurity and homelessness is important. Um, I think that youth and young adult homelessness and housing insecurity um, can be a little bit more difficult to um, explain to folks because people often don't, um, don't choose to engage with the system as much. Um, so that's, you know, less folks going to shelters and housing programs, but we see a lot more folks are doing things like couch surfing, um, staying with family and friends temporarily, living out of their cars, um, and maybe taking naps on campus um, or at libraries, things like that. Um, and so it can be, um, yeah, I think challenge some stereotypes of what people think of when they think of homelessness. Um, but yeah, not having access to stable and safe, um, secure housing um, ongoing basis is kind of what we're looking at here. So the DAX program, um, as I said, started back in 2015. Um, one of our you know, obvious main focuses is housing. Um, so once we um, are able to get folks into housing, we um, stop and do um, an intake and assessment and see, you know, what are some other areas that we can support you. Um, this is not a time when we sit down and say, this is what success looks like to the DAX program. How are we going to get you from point A to point B? Um, this is really a time where um, sit and listen to a student and what their goals are um, for um, for their life, how do they define success, um, and how can we support them in getting there. Um, so some of the things that we do is that monthly case management, we do counseling referrals. Um, yeah, I think it's important to recognize that housing insecurity and homelessness is um, a form of trauma um, and can really have an impact um, on the mental health and well-being of folks. Um, so getting people outside support as well. Um, we do transportation stipends. Um, I think this is really important. You know, we want people to get to job interviews and to class and, um, you know, be able to um, keep up with employment and things like that. But sometimes people don't have enough money for those initial um, train tickets um, or CTA passes to get there. So we do help with transportation. Um, and then food. So we do a monthly food stipend in addition to some other supports around food through partnerships in the community. Um, we see that housing and food insecurity go hand in hand. Most of the students that have expressed um, housing insecurity, um, um, excuse me, experiences around housing insecurity have also, you know, other common phrases are, you know, I didn't know where my next meal was going to come from, or, you know, I bought books for class um, and had to go without lunch that whole week, um, things like that. Um, so we also help with textbook assistance. Um, everyone that is in college <laughs> knows the challenges of textbook um, costs these days. Um, we won't go into all of my opinions on that, but they have just gotten astronomical um, and it's really unfair to students, you know, um, and also a really important piece to um, their academic journey. So we do help with textbooks. Um, I also work really closely with the Dean of Students Office around educational reimbursements and support around tuition. We have a lot of folks, especially undocumented folks, that may get um, 
a full tuition scholarship, but then do not have money for food or rent. Um, and so this is kind of an area where the DAX program can be um, a great fit if someone finds themselves, um, yeah, in a time of crisis. Um, and so lastly, um, the DAX program's theory of change, education and reducing student debt is the gateway to future independence and personal fulfillment. Um, a lot more people are going to um, uh, college and grad school than they used to. I think that there's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, one of them is not that it is more affordable. <laughs> um, it is more that, um, you know, people do have access to loans and scholarships, but also there's um, a lot more um, possible support at the beginning. Um, and also there's a lot more expectation and pressure around um, having to go to college. Um, so I think we also like to check in and see, um, you know, would it be, um, um, oh, would it make more sense for someone to go to community college for two years and then transfer to a four-year university? Um, things like that, not, um, yeah, it's not always a one-size-fits-all, um, is what I like to say. So for the DAX program, we have um, kind of our usual three models. We have our DAX houses, host homes, and the DAX dorm. I'm going to go through those pretty quickly. So right now we have two houses. One we lease from a church. Um, you know, there are lots of churches um, that have empty buildings right now. Um, our world looks very different than it used to. So some of these convents and rectories where priests would live, um, many of them are sitting empty. And so we rent some of these buildings at a reduced cost. Um, we also own a property. Um, so between those two, we can house up to 10 students. And we also have a house manager. Um, students pay a maximum rent of $150 a month. Um, I also like to add that students will not be um, evicted if they cannot afford to pay rent, um, but it is part of the program expectation right now. Um, so if they cannot afford to pay that $150 a month, how can we support people um, to get to the point where they can? Um, and then students do either a six month or one year lease with us. And we do try to work with juniors and seniors, um, do have priority for the DAX houses. Um, yeah, we see a lot of folks that are juniors and seniors, I think especially fifth year seniors, um, a lot of people that were RAs that their time has expired and they can't renew that contract um, and have just a few classes left. Um, so we're able to, um, to step in and support in those moments. Our host homes, um, so host homes are community members who have volunteered to open up their homes to a DAC student. Um, this is someone that has a spare bedroom or, um, you know, a mother-in-law suite or basement apartment, things like that, that are willing to donate that space to the program um, to work with students in that way. We also have dorm rooms. Um, from time to time at the university. And so um, at DePaul, it's kind of on a case by case basis. I know um, Loyola of Chicago is starting a program where a whole floor, excuse me, of a dorm is going to be used for a similar program. Um, so I think anytime that there, um, yeah, can be partnerships with the university to provide that on campus living experience for um, their students at a either reduced cost um, or if it is um, paid for from some other funds um, can be really great for students. Um, so goals, um, this is one of our recent graduates, um, <laughs> Carolyn, we just had a long conversation this morning um, about how she's doing um, and I forgot that she was on my slide. So it's nice to see her face again. Um, so short term, um, create and maintain um, effective pathways for students um, to reach their academic goals. So basically I think the, um, the gist of it is we are trying to support students to get to graduation if that um, is what they want. Um, we try to work with um, universities in the community. Um, I don't, it is not my intention to ever reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, we don't need to be having different seminars and classes on employment and financial fitness when I can partner with an organization that does those workshops every week um, and utilize their services um, instead since they are the experts. Um, 
and then we want to support diversity and inclusivity to create equitable opportunities for students to reach individual goals. Um, as we have talked about, um, housing and access to higher education, um, this is a racial justice issue. This is a class justice issue. So this is kind of a space where all of these things intersect and we see um, supporting these students um, as they're working towards graduation as yeah, a, um, a short-term um, support. I would say the longer term, more systemic things, we are trying to um, partner with more organizations um, and universities all over the US. Um, I think one of the big things, I just got news um, that one of the policies we've been working on with some other organization um, are um, now a Senate bill. I'm gonna click on this so people can see. Um, yeah, so we just had um, the Senate Bill to um, increase college access for students that are experiencing housing insecurity. This full screen. Um, so this is one of the things that we've been working on. Um, and then some other um, examples by state, I think are important. So this can look like um, specific funds or housing um, access at different schools. Um, you know, like a floor or a specific amount of dorm rooms or something like that for students experiencing housing insecurity, or it could look like, um, you know, a liaison in the office um, that is working specifically around these issues um, to support students. And then lastly, my contact information. Um, so if anyone has any questions or um, concerns, thoughts, whatever, feel free. Um, I would say preferred would be email um, to reach out about any questions. Um, and I think that is it for now. <laughs> really ran through that, so. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That was fantastic. And I'm inspired to hear that such programs exist. And I hope they become much more of a commonality for other institutions in the future as well. Um, since we have 15 or 17 minutes left to be precise, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back over to Sandy to wrap it us for up, to wrap it us for up. And she's going to talk a little bit about some bills that are currently in the Texas legislature along with some other ways that people can get involved in this fight against housing security. Thank you. Uh, so, um, Oh, well, first, I, I want to just say um, $150 monthly rent, you know, hallelujah. Um, so many people need that. And um, uh, it sounds like a great program because um, as bad as private Texas uh, landlords are, I know that university landlords, there's, you know, some big national companies that really prey on students. And, um, you know, on-campus housing tends not to be cheap either. So, uh, you know, your alternative sounds um, really, really incredible. Uh, but meanwhile, um, again, the Texas legislature, once every two years, January to May, uh, our organization since its inception has used it as an opportunity to try to advance tenants' rights. It's not a super friendly and welcoming atmosphere down there for these types of issues, but um, we typically do get something through. Sometimes it's baby steps forward. Uh, but because of the pandemic, um, I think there's been a lot of understanding and interest and focused on, on housing and tenants' rights and an eviction in particular that uh, hasn't existed in the past, and I'm hoping that it will maybe make a difference um, in this coming session. So um, uh, first, and I'll go through these pretty quickly, but almost every state in the country has something called the opportunity to cure a default uh, before eviction. Um, it's like 43 states at least, uh, including the state of Mississippi, that instead of as in Texas, you being able to get a 24 hour notice to vacate and then the landlord can file with the court and, and it can say, well, wait a minute, I've got it now. You know, you're at the landlord's mercy. They can take it and still evict because you're in violation when you defaulted by not paying on time. And, um, you know, or, uh, you know, so they can take it or not. Um, they can take it and still go through with the eviction. They can take it and, and um, uh, get a judgment against you, but, uh, 
um, but not follow through with, with the set out. Um, so there's two bills that have been filed uh, that relate to this. Uh, one um, is, you know, this House Bill 2801. Uh, the other, it's uh, this House Bill 4039 is a, is a large tenant landlord bill, but both uh, would expand um, the tenants' rights and give tenants the right to, to cure the default. So Mississippi, I mentioned, because they tend not to be known for, you know, at the, the head of um, these types of issues, civil rights or consumer rights. Um, and their, their right to cure uh, allows a tenant to retain their housing. And uh, if they pay what they owe and the fees that they owe uh, up until the date of judgment. Um, and, you know, it, homelessness is not just a problem for the individual household or the individual family. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's certainly a tragedy there, and it has long-term implications when somebody has an eviction on their record. Um, but it's also, you know, a, 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 it doesn't, it's not good for the community as a whole. Um, I know when the HMK crisis was going on, um, uh, later heard from a chaplain at, at the hospital, Parkland Hospital, that said the, the increases in emergency room visits with high blood pressure and diabetes, you know, the stress that it puts people through to be facing housing insecurity, you know, uh, it has ripple effects and, and it's just um, much more cost effective from the taxpayer standpoint to keep people housed than it is to just willy nilly let people fall into homelessness at the whim of their landlords, um, you know, and so the opportunity to cure is one step in that direction. Another is creating some confidential confidentiality around eviction records. So there's several bills that have been filed here. Uh, that first one, House Bill 1647, did have a hearing last week, but it's still pending in committee. So um, uh, we, we hope that it will get out, but the filing of eviction case is a public record. So you don't have to, um, you don't have to, to lose um, and as I mentioned earlier, we don't have just cause eviction protection. So somebody might get filed against because they got a 30 day notice and they couldn't get out on time. And so then they were told, you know, they got, they can get a 30 day notice just at the end of the term of the lease for no reason whatsoever or for, for the landlord's reason they want to gentrify. Um, you know, they're ready to kick people out and move on. And so, you know, uh, getting a 30 day notice is, uh, you know, even if you have deep pockets, it's hard to move in that kind of time frame. But when you don't have deep pockets, it's pretty much impossible. So, um, so these bills would allow um, eviction records to be confidential. Um, uh, the one until the landlord won the case and then um, after three years has passed. Uh, the second set of bills would are similar, but it would be five years after the final judgment and or the judge could determine that it's in the public's interest. So sometimes people get evicted when the, the landlord gets foreclosed upon and, and they have to leave because the new owner wants to move in and they don't they can't get out on time. You know, that would be in the public interest, probably. Um, and there's other situations, too. So um, two very important bills to try to reduce the harm for from eviction. Um, there's several ones that deal with discrimination protections. Um, as I mentioned at the start, one of the programs that helps low-income people um, try to stay housed is the Section 8 voucher program. Um, and a lot of people like, you know, they can be on a voucher, they can have to wait years, first of all, for a voucher waiting list to open. And then they're, once it opens, they're on it for years. Um, and then they, they think, okay, life is going to be easier. I've got my Section 8 voucher. My rent's going to drop and because the, the government's going to help me pay now. But uh, landlords don't have to take those vouchers. Private landlords can say, we don't participate in that program. And many states and other cities, counties around the country prohibit discrimination against voucher holders. Texas doesn't. So um, these are bills that uh, uh, would... Um, the first two would just expand the state's Fair Housing Act to say you, you can't discriminate against voucher holders. The other one, um, House Bill 886, that's probably going to have a hearing next Wednesday, would repeal a state law that was passed um, when uh, the city of Austin passed their voucher anti-discrimination ordinance in 2014. The Apartment Association uh, got, got a bill filed and passed to prohibit cities or counties from enacting those protections. So. 
Um, there are several others down here. Um, one that per, uh, per, uh, prohibits discrimination based on um, being 65 or older. Others uh, based on sexual orientation or gender identity or expression. Some cities do already prohibit that, but the state law doesn't, the federal law doesn't. Um, and then uh, one here uh, relating to uh, you can't con consider nonviolent criminal history when you're um, somebody's applying for housing if it's um, four years after a misdemeanor or eight years after a felony. Um, so there's a uh, bed bug extermination. Um, one of the things that uh, happens when you rent uh, from anybody that uses the Texas Apartment Association lease, there's likely to be a bed bug addendum where you're certifying that there aren't any bed bugs at the time of move in and that if they were ever found, um, you agree to be charged um, for extermination if the landlord chooses to charge you. Um, you know, bed bugs can be brought in by leasing agents, by maintenance men, by extermination officials from the next door neighbor. Uh, bed bugs are in five star hotels that get cleaned each and every day. Um, uh, and what we see is when uh, it's, it's, it's just, um, you know, when, when landlords have a, a, a practice of charging tenants for bed bugs and tenants know they can't afford to pay the bill, uh, if they if they report them, then guess what? They're not going to report because they know they can't afford the bill, and that's going to you know that leads to bed bugs just um, spreading. So um, uh, this bill would uh, require the landlord to inspect and treat for bed bugs at their own expense unless the tenant opts out. Um, there's several related to rent increases. Um, property code actually doesn't spell out how much notice needs to be given um, explicitly. There is language in the property code that talks about if you pay by the month, you have a month to month lease. If you pay by the week, you have a week to week lease. And so it would follow that you would be entitled to a month's notice at least. However, um, people need more time, you know, uh, when they know the rent is going up, um, you know, they shouldn't be having to make a split second decision. We've had people, you know, come to our office, uh, their lease is up one day and they're presented with a new contract and, you know, it might have a hundred or $200 rent increase. So um, the bill that we asked to be filed several sessions back would have given a 30 day think time. Um, the apartment association fought that but agreed to a seven day think time and that's the bill that has been filed. So if, if there's a hearing on this thing, it has a decent chance of possibly getting out since the apartment association is, is not, uh, not gonna oppose the weekend version. And then there's a couple that just deal with uh, properties that have been built with tax credits. Um, there were some landlords that were increasing rent um, as soon as HUD produce the new allowable rents. There's certain management company that just, uh, um, and so put, put that lease at denim on and people would sign a lease for a year and they might be a month or two in and then all of a sudden, um, uh, you know, they'd be told, you know, your rent's going up by 50 or 100 bucks. Um, so that will be prohibited in if those bills pass. Uh, there were a slew of bills. You can see the ones that have the higher numbers. You know, this first one, um, would prohibit evictions from taking place during a, a pandemic. Um, but uh, after the February storm, there were a lot of others that got filed related to disasters to prohibit evictions or allow easy termination from the lease. Uh, one down here that students might be interested in is, um, and we got a lot of calls on this in the spring, but this House Bill uh, 4104 would allow students to terminate a lease if there was a, a state of disaster and the institution of higher education um, closes their campus for 30 or more days and they're not able to attend. Because in the spring, there were a lot of people who had signed leases already for the fall. They weren't going back for in-person learning, and but they were under contract and people started getting reported to credit bureaus and collection agencies, you know, as soon as they were trying to terminate those contracts. So um, to have input, um, I know students have a ton of free time, <laughs> uh, but, you know, maybe you can get some credit for some of this. I don't know, um, particularly, you know, the political science folk, um, but, uh, you know, 
now is the time to be contacting state senators and state reps. Uh, there's a, and I, I should have put it on this slide, but who represents me is, uh, is, a, is a link on our website. If you're registered to vote on the back of your voter registration card, it will give you your state Senate district and your state house district. Um, now's a good time to be calling and visiting or um, writing to their offices. Uh, committee uh, hearings are happening now. Um, and you, we get about four, well, uh, we'll find out like on a Thursday night, you know, what's on the agenda for a hearing on Tuesday. Um, uh, same time, same timing for a hearing on Monday, I think. Um, uh, so it's not a, not a big lead time, but uh, uh, there, they were, some committees were allowing virtual testimony, which certainly made things easier. Um, I think many of them aren't doing that anymore, so it's hard to get to Austin, but if you happen to have family there and can be there, um, you can drop in and testify. Otherwise, um, the agendas, uh, once the agendas are, are published, uh, there's usually a link to be able to submit written comments, and it can be as short as, I'm in favor of this bill or I'm opposed to this bill. And the other workaround we're trying to do right now is to have people make little, you know, short videos on, um, uh, you know, if they can't be there and we'll, we'll post them on Twitter and tag the bill sponsor or the committee chair or something like that. If people have a horror story that they want to share. So, um, this is, uh, where most tenant landlord bills go in the house. Um, if you live in any of these districts or vote in any of these districts, um, you got an extra role to play. Um, I've got more, but I know time is running out and, um, but again, if you, you know, want to follow some political process, you can watch the hearings online. Um, and, uh, you know, if you want, you want things to Texas tenant landlord law to, you know, get into the 1980s, um, now's a good time to <coughs> weigh in. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and stop the share, but I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much for that, Sandy. I do want to be respectful of everyone's time, and I know that we're nearing close to the end of this event at 1.30, but the graphic that was used to advertise this event has my email, so if anybody wants to connect to anybody on the panel or any of our speakers, feel free to send me an email, and I will gladly connect the two of you. I just want to take one more time to thank everybody who is here. Thank you, Lizzie, Stephanie, Sandy, Emily, and Yash. I admire the bravery that all of you exhibit, and thank you for taking the time off your Friday afternoon to chat with us. Um, I am going to go ahead and let everybody go, but thank you again for being here. I wish we were in a world where we could clap for, for you all. Take care, everybody, and thank you for joining if you tuned in. <laughs>